The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light. But he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law, indeed, was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is only God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It was just six days ago, Monday morning, Christmas Day, that the lectionary, that schedule of readings that guides what we read in church every Sunday morning, gave us the same passage from John's Gospel as a reading on Christmas Day. And on that day... As we gathered here with the smell of incense still in the room, we held John's gospel up next to that manger and we marveled in awe and wonder at the way that all of time and all of creation had been channeled down into one place, one moment, one person in time. This child born in the manger who was before all things and was with God. Here in our midst, God among us, Emmanuel. But today, the first Sunday after Christmas, we revisit that same passage from John. And six days isn't a lot of time for reflection. It's not a lot of time to develop our perspective on exactly what it was that happened in that manger 2,000 years ago. Fortunately, we have Paul and we have John and his community to help us understand the significance and the ramifications of God in our midst. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul talks about the law, the commandments that God gave to us as a gift, a way to walk 
within the confines of the relationship that God has established between us and God, a way to live more fully into what is being offered to us, a way for us to realize the peace of God which passes all understanding that comes through living in God's love, light, grace, and mercy. Over time, it became apparent to us that none of us, however, could live up to the letter of that law. None of us is able of our own accord to follow all of those commandments perfectly. And so each of us are destined to fall short of the life to which God calls us. That reality and that truth turned the law into what Paul names here as a disciplinarian, as a prison. The law became not a joyful response to the love of God, but a checklist of things that we had to do and say or not do and not say in order to find ourselves loved by, embraced by the God for whom we so desperately long. The gift that we had been given had been distorted and turned into something that was not life-giving but life-taking. Paul tells us that in this moment, when God is born in our midst, when God becomes flesh, when God takes on our human nature, the law changes, the law shifts in our lives and our understanding. The law is actually restored to that for which it was originally intended. Because God comes among us as one of us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth to help us understand that we are children of the God who created us, loved beyond measure, loved beyond our understanding, loved beyond our experience of any other love in the world. In another letter, Paul says that what this means is that there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so knowing that we are loved, knowing that that is established and fixed in God's heart, the law ceases to be a checklist, a list of things that we have to do in order to be loved because we recognize that we're already loved. Just as Abraham had become God's chosen long before the Ten Commandments were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, the law is not a cookbook for our arrival in heaven. The law is, in fact, a way for us to live more fully into the relationship with God that we already have that's established in the person of Christ Jesus. What John helps us to understand, amplifying what Paul had written. And Paul was probably writing 10, 15 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. John is writing 30 years after that, having spent time steeping in the Christian tradition at that point, the letters, the writings, John helps us to see that if we believe that Jesus is who we claim he is, then we know that his witness and testimony, his life represents God's true nature. If we believe that Jesus is who we say he is, then Jesus' life, his willingness to give himself over into our hands to allow us to reject him to the point of nailing him to the tree and then coming back to love us anyway is reflective of God's true nature and who God truly is. 
God's not watching over us, waiting for us to slip up so that we can be shunted off into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. God has already embraced us, and that will never change. The law is there to help us to live more fully into the gift that's being offered. And that gift is the light and love made manifest in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. John tells us he came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will or of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. If we believe He is who we say he is. And if we believe the testimony and witness of his life, if we believe that we are beloved of God and that nothing can ever change that, then we can be transformed so that the law no longer feels like a set of constraints with its hands around our throat waiting for us to make a mistake we can once again see the law for the gift that was intended. A way to live more fully into the life to which God calls us. A way to maximize our joy. A way to maximize our peace. By following those commandments, we are adopting God's way of life even as God is adopting us as God's own children. Here today, we are still celebrating the Feast of the Incarnation. We celebrate Christmas until the day of the Epiphany next Saturday, when I would like to invite you all to come to a sung service of evening prayer. But we are still standing at that manger, recognizing the gift that we have been given And through the writings of Paul, through the writings of John's community, through the reflections that have gone on, the theology that has been argued and discussed and gone back and forth for the last 2,000 years, we can come to an understanding of what has happened in this moment that is liberating and life-changing. God loves us so much that God has stepped among us as one of us, being born in human form and taking the likeness of a slave even unto death. God loves us so much that God would not leave us under the tyranny of a law that we could not fulfill And despite our inability to live according to those commandments, God has come among us to tell us that God loves us anyway. That is a profound gift. It's what drew people to the manger. It's what drew people here on Christmas Eve as we celebrated. It's what drew people here on Christmas Day. And I would dare to suggest it's what draws us here every Sunday, that promise that we can and we are able to walk in the light and love and grace of God because God has dared to love us first. That is, after all, what's happening here. God has taken the risk of coming to us as a child, dependent upon us for everything, completely at the mercy of our willingness to raise, to care for, to love that child. God does this with no guarantee, with no assured results, but offers to us an invitation vulnerable, God stands in our midst and says, I love you and waits with bated breath to hear our response. Amen.